to Accessible Art History, the podcast, Season 11. As mentioned in the trailer, this season will focus solely on women artists. Too often, they've been relegated to the sidelines of art and history. So, I want to feature them and teach you about how they overcame adversity to change the world around them. All images and sources will be in the associated blog post linked in the description details. Make sure to follow at accessible.art.history on Instagram for all updates. So, without further ado, let's get started. Today's artist is named Raquel Roesch. She was a still-life painter from the Netherlands and the best-recorded female artist of the Dutch Golden Age. Accounts describe her as the, quote, Amsterdam Palace, Holland's art prodigy, and our subtle art heroine. Roesch's work of elaborate flower arrangements have struck viewers for generations. In addition to a successful career, she also raised 10 children. This is something almost unheard of in the 17th and 18th centuries. So to learn more about this remarkable woman, keep on listening. Raquel Roesch was born on June 3, 1664, in The Hague. Her father was a botany professor named Friedrich. He was famous for his embalming techniques. Friedrich used these techniques to preserve plants, animals, and even human anatomy for further study. His personal collection contained over 2,000 items. Raquel would study these items and use her drawings to inform her paintings. Her father saw this interest, and he encouraged his daughter to pursue this career path. It was here that Raquel learned to depict flora and fauna with startling accuracy. Raquel's mother was a woman named Maria Post. Her father was an architect named Peter Post, and many of his buildings are still standing in the Netherlands today. When she was 15 years old, Roish gained an apprenticeship with artist William van Alst. He was a prominent flower painter in Amsterdam. The most significant thing that she learned during this apprenticeship was how to paint vases and arrange the flowers into interesting compositions. They were meant to appear spontaneous, yet dramatic. Essentially, it was Baroque sensibilities for inanimate flowers. By the age of 18, Roish was selling her works to patrons. Roish continued to work for the next six decades and is believed to have painted over 250 works. She was a member of the Confrerie Pittura and possibly a member of the Guild of St. Luke in the city of Amsterdam. These were academic and professional groups with exclusive benefits and membership list. From 1708 to 1716, Roish served as a court painter to Johann Wilhelm, the Elector Palatine of Bavaria. She was able to work out a deal where she painted from her home studio so she could care for her large family and traveled to the elector's court a few times a year to bring paintings. This shows us just how in demand her paintings were. In her day, Roish's paintings would sell for up to 1,200 guilders. This was a lot of money back then. In addition, her famous contemporary Rembrandt rarely was able to sell his works for more than 500 guilders. Today, her paintings are found throughout museums and private collections in Europe and the United States. This shows her reach and fame. In 1693, Roish married fellow artist, a portraitist named Jurian Poole. As she was 29 years old at the time and had an established career, Raquel kept her maiden name. Together they had 10 children, with the youngest being born when she was 47 years old. By all accounts, the marriage seemed to be a good one. Roish continued to pursue her artistic career, especially because of the money it brought in. She has truly proved that women can do it all. One reason that Roish was able to accomplish all of this was because of the area she lived in. Traditionally, the Netherlands had been more progressive toward women artists than other areas of Europe. In addition, she painted still lifes. This did not involve viewing or studying anatomy, especially male anatomy. It made it more appropriate for her gender. Rachel Roish died on October 12, 1750. Her husband passed away five years earlier. Today, she is remembered as being a remarkable innovator in the world of still life. Next, I'm going to discuss more about Roish's style and techniques. But first, let's take a quick break. I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring accessible art history, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, but they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part? It's absolutely free to use. 
As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm, that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. All right, now that we're back, let's dive into Horatia's style. As I've discussed throughout the episode, she is known for her distinct, scientific, naturalistic style. Access to her father's collection meant that she could take her time examining flowers and insects to include into her work. This led to her including the most minute of details. This gives you something new to discover within every inch of the painting. Fascinatingly, Royce used both moss and butterfly wings to add texture and realism to her work. Although she grouped together flowers that weren't in season together, the effort was nonetheless stunning. Her paintings are almost all focused on the flower arrangements themselves. The backgrounds are dark, black voids within a single source of illuminated light. This is a hallmark of the Baroque and Dutch Golden Age periods. One of my personal favorite Roish works is featured over on the blog. It's called Roses, Convolulus, Poppies, and Other Flowers in an Urn on a Stone Ledge, and was painted in 1688. As the title suggests, it features an abundance of flowers in an urn turned vase. Although there are many different species of flowers, Roish didn't forget about the small details. If the viewer looks closely, they will be able to see individual grains of pollen. The pyramid-shaped composition forces the viewer's eye to remain within the flower bouquet, ensuring that they take in every detail. The dynamic use of color and texture is a Baroque hallmark. In addition, the asymmetry adds another layer of visual interest. One final note about this piece is that Roish chose to use an urn as a vase. This was a common theme in Dutch art called memento mori. It was a way for people to understand and assimilate death into their lives and learn to accept it as the inevitable. Raquel Roish was a trailblazer. She was a successful artist and a loving mother who found a level of success hardly seen before. Her techniques brought her works to life, creating scenes of botanical beauty for her clients to enjoy. Make sure to tune in next week when I discuss another amazing woman artist. Adelaide Labelle Guillard. Thank you for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. New episodes will premiere each Monday, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review. Make sure you follow Accessible Art History on Instagram at accessible.art.history for all updates and daily art of the day posts. See you next time!